Hey everyone, this is Bathymetrics, and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the subject of clipping. And I'm going to be making the case for why you should be using a lot of clippers throughout your projects, and uh, why you really shouldn't be reaching for compressors and limiters as nearly as often as you do. Um, that's a pretty provocative statement. Uh, I'm going to make some more provocative statements in a minute, but j just to give you some context, this is pretty much a follow-up to the last video I did uh, at the end of last year about my mastering deep dive and why you might want to achieve competitive loudness. Uh, and by competitive loudness, we mean typically songs that are hitting in the range of negative seven luffs integrated across your loudest drop. Uh, so the whole song end-to-end -end might fall into anywhere from negative 10 luffs to negative 8 luffs to a negative 7.5 luffs, depending on the type of song it is. But, but the basic idea is you want your loudest section to be hitting pretty much right around negative 7 luffs as you measure the, that loudest section and average it out. So you can watch that old video if you haven't. Uh, that's where I make the case for this. And it applies to pretty much all genres of electronic music and pop music these days. Um, certain electronic genres don't necessarily need to strive for such competitive loudness, but uh, if you're playing in the dance music space, it's definitely something you want to consider. So what I didn't really cover in that last video, the last video focused on why you would want to do that, and it focused on two of the better mastering limiters that people who master loud tend to like. Um, but there's another whole trick, another secret to getting loud masters that are very clean and transparent and aren't, you know, doing ridiculous things to the original mix. So that trick is, is using clippers and saturators very liberally throughout your entire project, not just one, but a bunch everywhere. <laughs> and avoiding the use of compressors, right? Like, I use very few compressors in my projects. Most of my dynamic range control is being done by clippers, and specifically hard clippers, not even soft clippers. So I'm going to make a case for that. I'm going to show you why that's a good thing to do. Um, and the big problem here is that new producers are generally taught that the main tools for controlling dynamic range are compressors and occasionally limiters, like you might put a limiter on a group bus, but you'll use compressors on various tracks within that group. And over and over and over, you see YouTube video where somebody's going, doing a walkthrough, explaining how they do something and say, I'm going to throw a glue compressor on this track just to control the peaks a little bit. I'm going to throw, you know, this compressor or that compressor on the bus to, you know, glue it together and control the peaks, right? Bring down the dynamic range. Uh, honestly, we're taught that because um, compressors are such a hard thing to wrap your head around when you're new, uh, that there's a lot of videos that try and help you understand compressors. I mean, there's upward compression, downward compression, there's upward expansion, there's downward expansion, there's multiband compression, right? There's, there's all these different styles of compression and they all do very useful things, no question. But here I'm going to make a, a basic assertion I want, I hope will really stick in your mind. Compressors are for changing the dynamic rhythm of a sound. They're for changing the timbre of a sound. They're for, they're for sculpting or cutting in or emphasizing a kind of rhythmic feel. Because compressors and limiters work in the time domain. They carve shapes into your signal over time, okay? And they're meant to basically change the sound a little bit. I mean, the extreme example being OTT. When you throw OTT on a, on a mid-bass sound to make that thing really nasty and in your face and emphasize the highs a little more than the mid-range and maybe really squash the, the sub-frequencies and crank it up so it's just a, a loud in-your-face mid-range bass, you're changing the sound. You're not controlling dynamic range. Okay, so yes, compressors work theoretically by, you know, moving a little invisible volume knob up and down, right? And, and changing 
the dynamic range, but they do it in a, a way over time that's a lot more like setting up an ADSR envelope on a synth note so that it, when it attacks a new note, it has a certain feeling to it. it it either hits really hard or it hits gently and it fades out really fast or it has a long fade out and tail. That's more what compressors are designed to do. To do a straight up control of dynamic range to like bring down the peaks and control them. Like look at my screen here. This top track is a typical um, mix. Uh, could be a bus mix, could be a full uh, master mix on the, on the master group. But it's, it's a typical mix. There's, there's synth-type sounds and melodic sounds in these darker, denser areas. And then all these little spiky caterpillar peaks way out at the edges are, are percussion hits and drum hits. Like you can see, these are like purely kick or snare-type shapes right here, right? And then these little spiky things, well, there's all kinds of percussion going on in this track. But the point is, this is usually bad and you usually want to control these really wide peaks to be a little more like this. And specifically what we're looking at here is a track that is uh, sitting at about negative 12 luffs. It's using the typical full dynamic range that you would, um, that a lot of the YouTube pundits advise you to master for, for like Spotify and YouTube, et cetera. They say, make full use of the dynamic range. Don't do this because you're leaving all this dynamic range on the table you haven't used, right? Your, your track's gonna sound lifeless and squashed compared to something like this, okay? But they're wrong and I'm gonna show you why they're wrong. Uh, it's been a constant message in a lot of my videos that have to do with mastering is that the whole argument about the loudness war is full of a lot of claims that aren't really true. They're theoretically true, but they're not practically true. So we're going to demo that today. Um, but the basic idea is con compressors don't do this very well. They do a terrible job of like just controlling the peaks because compressors carve new envelopes over time. They work across the time domain. A clipper, on the other hand, is instantaneous and simply reshapes the wave. It doesn't carve new envelopes over time. Uh, there's a little bit of a a little bit of a nuance there when we start talking about soft clipping versus hard clipping, but certainly for hard clippers, literally it's like taking a laser beam or a weed whacker or something and just cutting right across the tops of all those peaks to get this shape. And you might say, well, that's terrible. Isn't that going to introduce a lot of distortion and just make it sound bad? Well, the answer is no. And let me demonstrate that. I'm going to demonstrate that for you right now. So here is this track that we're going to measure it, measure its loudness. We're going to look at the integrated LUFS value here, and we're going to play this through a couple of times. Okay, so you can see down here the oscilloscope showing it scroll by. It looks exactly the same as the printed version up here. And we can see right here that this is measuring negative 12 LUFs, which is like the perfect sweet spot that all the well-intentioned YouTube videos saying you should master specifically for Spotify or YouTube, they would tell you to do this. They would say this is a perfectly mastered track because your, your percussive instruments that have sharp, punchy transients are able to make full use of that dynamic range that's available to you on Spotify or YouTube, etc. Okay? Now, if you follow my advice and you master to a more competitive level, you got to get rid of those spikes. You've got to make it look more like this. So what we're going to do is turn on this rack and we're going to use a limiter. Uh, specifically, we're using FabFilter Pro L2, right? We're going to use a limiter to uh, shave off these peaks and make it look a lot more like this. Now, it's still going to read 12 LUFs unless... Well, let me go ahead and make it temporarily louder for you, just so you can hear that it truly is louder. I'm just going to turn off this one little feature in Pro L2. Now we'll leave Pro L open so you can see that it's measuring the same as what we're going to see over here. 
So let's play this briefly mastered. It's going to be a little louder. Don't worry, it's not going to blow your ears out. It's a mellow track. So here we go. Okay, so you could see that the crest factor indicators were in the green, which means you know, it's still got plenty of dynamic range. In fact, sometimes it was going over into the gray here. Watch this one more time. Just breathe. Okay, that is not an over squashed dynamic range, right? That's, that's a pretty standard crest factor for any kind of mastered professional music. Uh, we could see that this thing was measuring about uh, negative seven bluffs integrated almost exactly. So this is, and it was, you know, peaks were right at zero and ignore true peak because true peak is superfluous. Uh, I'm not going to rehash that in this video. Go watch the last video, but nobody pays attention to true peak. So this is a typical competitive loudness. And I'm going to come back here and do the uh, kind of automatic gain reduction so that it sounds the same as the original. I just wanted you to see that this was in fact hitting negative seven two luffs. And now we are going to A, B compare this limiter. Oh, I think the other thing to show you about the limiter is it was doing about negative six dB of gain reduction right here. This red bar was going as high as negative 6.2. So you know, we were put, it was close to zero already, and we pushed it up six decibels of gain to get it down to negative seven luffs. And so it's having to do about 6.2 dB of gain reduction. All right. So <clears throat> let's A, B, the limited version versus the original at the same relative volume and see if you can hear any significant difference. See if it sounds like the limiter doing a full 6 dB of gain reduction, which is way too much for a limiter, honestly. See if it's really making it sound bad. Okay, so let's hear it dry. I'm going to turn this off. Okay, so you can hear it's essentially the same. Even though we have shaved uh, all those peaks down, it's very transparent. It sounds almost the same as the original, it's just louder, right? Any kind of distortion that's been added from the limiting process, even a, a he relatively heavy six decibels of gain reduction, uh, hasn't really affected it too much. Now I'm gonna blow your mind. We are now gonna use a simple hard clipper to do the same exact thing. This is Newfangled Audio's Saturate. Even though it's called Saturate, it is a clipper, okay? And it's a, it's a clipper because it can go 100% hard clipping, or if you make it more soft, then it's more of a saturator, right? So that's why it's called Saturate, because clippers and saturators are the same thing. It's just what is the actual shape of the algorithm? How is it doing what a clipper does to the sound? So we're going to use it in a 100% hard. You would think that would sound really distorted, right? Uh, if you don't know anything about clippers, you would just go, whoa, hard clipping. Six decibels of hard clipping, right, right here. Well, let's see what it sounds like. Um, and I'm going to turn off my mic so that there's really nothing inter interfering with the sound. And what I'm going to do is play the hard clipper, and then I'm going to compare it with the limiter by jumping back and forth. And then I'm going to compare it with the original dry and just, you know, let you really hear this clipper versus the limiter and what it sounds like, okay?
Okay, I think that's enough uh, to give you the idea. You heard that in total isolation without any bleed from my mic coming in. Could you hear a difference? Really? I don't think you can, because there's almost no difference. The differences are incredibly subtle. And hopefully this demonstrates that clippers are something you should know about. <laughs> Clippers are wonderful, and it's really a shame that uh, almost hardly anyone on YouTube really talks about using saturators to control dynamic range, and almost nobody talks about using clippers. Um, Mixbus TV talks about using clippers. I've hardly ever seen anyone else talk about them. And Mixbus TV will like demo a clipper and say, wow, see how transparent this is and how loud you can get things, but they never really go into details about how clippers work why they work, how to set them so that you're getting transparent results, and so on. But hopefully I've caught your attention. I've made some provocative statements. Stop using compressors. Compressors change your sound. Use your compressors for sound design when you want to fundamentally change the sound of something. Or use compressors to do what we call gluing on a bus where you have several different sounds in a track that are all feeding together into a group bus. And one of them has kind of a dominant percussive element and the other ones have maybe slightly different percussive feels going on with them. And you kind of want to make one of them control the others in a, um, a rhythmic beat oriented way, right? That's when you bring out a glue compressor and do a little gluing. Um, other than that, don't use compressors to try to do this. And I'm going to show you now, we're going to, we're going to flip over briefly to a different demo where I'm going to show you a kick track. We're looking at this pink track right here that's just a bunch of kicks. Let me turn off the compressor. Here's an um, oscilloscope beforehand and an oscilloscope after. Whoops, let's uh, mute that and unmute that. Okay, just your basic fat kick. It's already got a good shape. Let me freeze this one. So here's the transient. These lines that are really close together, the high frequency transient, uh, rolling into the kind of mid frequencies of the, of the knock and the pitch drop. And then we get into these longer, more stable tail type frequencies. And it's, it's got a good dynamic shape to it. It's fairly punchy. Overall, so it's a little compressed here, you know, but a lot of sample kicks straight out of the box are a little over compressed. And normally most of us would do some reshaping on this with an EQ or compressors, because again, compressors cut an envelope over time and you can use a compressor to make this much more punchy if you want. But I'm not gonna go into that it's a subject for a different uh, video. It's your typical standard kick. And we're gonna use a variety of different tricks on it to try and control this, this peak, this dynamic range. So let's see what happens. We want to, let's pretend we want to just shave it down to about here or this line maybe, right? That's what we want to do is just push this kick down so it's not so peaky in our track. Um, so we're going to turn this on and we're going to use a standard fab filter compressor, right? Good old fab filter. Let me turn off look ahead because a lot of compressors don't have look ahead. Uh, FabFilter Pro C is one of the few that do. Okay, so here's what Pro C does to this particular kick signal. Watch over here. What's going on here? That peak is almost as high as the original. How is that happening? Why is that happening? It's compressing everything after that point really nicely. It's cutting a new shape into it, a new envelope. But it's leaving that big peak in front. What's up with that? All right, let's try a multiband compressor. Now, this is a, a home-built multiband, kind of like Ableton's multiband dynamics device. Uh, this is using the Bitwig equivalent of that. I have a Bitwig multiband container and each one has a copy of FabFilter Pro C in it, right? So I've got a Pro C on the lows, a Pro C on the mids, a Pro C on the highs. It's multiband. There you go. So what is this one going to do to the signal? Let's watch. Hmm. We still have this big peak. It hasn't done anything for that peak. If anything, it's exaggerated. It's probably a little bigger than the original. 
Yep. See, the original doesn't quite go to that outer line, the zero, uh, zero dB full scale line up here. This one actually is going past zero dB and just being hard clipped by the channel itself, right? So that's a wash. Let's try, we're going to skip the transient shaper for this one. Let's try a glue compressor, right? So I'm in Bitwig, I don't have Ableton's glue compressor, but this is what the glue compressor is based on. This is exactly the same thing. I'm even going to leave the peak clip, the soft clipping button on, right? Fast as possible attack. Relatively fast release, um, right? Let's see what it does. You're going to see it's doing probably about 6 dB of compression. Yeah. See how it's pounding up to here, right up to the 6 mark? So what does it do over here? Huh. Look at that huge peak still. It's doing a terrible job of actually controlling the dynamic range. It's doing a great job of reshaping everything after that initial first start of the transient, but it's leaving that transient peak there. Hmm. This is weird, huh? Hey, let's try the famous 1176 compressor. In this case, it's the Waves emulation of it. Where are you? Right? We're using the Waves version, but this compressor is famous for having a super fast attack. Fastest, fastest attack, right? What does it do? Again? Huh. That's what... Let's get it frozen for you. All right, that's odd. Still got a peak. What's going on here? Compressors are supposed to handle this. Compressors are supposed to push those peaks down. How are you going to get your peak to RMS ratio down so you don't have big, huge, spiky, peaky masters that drive your compressors crazy and your limiters crazy and your mix bus crazy and uh, prevent you from getting loud sounds? Because every time a limiter hits a peak like this, it's going to squash everything really hard to try and push this down to where you want to get. So you can't be sending big, huge peaks like this into your final mastering compressor or problems happen, okay? And all these compressors aren't doing any kind of actual controlling of those peaks. What does every YouTube video show you? Oh, I'm throwing OTT, I'm sorry, I'm throwing the glue compressor on this track to control peaks. Let's shave these peaks down by five dBs. Well, I'm shaving them down by about six dB and it ain't doing anything, okay? So what's going on here? I could keep going, but here's the deal. Compressors just operate a certain way, and unless you have a compressor that has a look-ahead feature on it, you're never going to catch that very first peak because the compressor hears the peak, reacts to it, starts to clamp down, and that clamping down takes place over time, and it misses the very first thing that triggered it. It doesn't catch it. Now, there's one compressor in my whole arsenal that actually has the ability to do look ahead, and that's Pro C. So if we turn on the look ahead, and we're going to set it to zero look ahead, like no look ahead at all in the actual look ahead slider. And let's watch this, oscill uh, this oscilloscope now. Okay, with even though look ahead is on, we're still getting that peak slip through because the look ahead isn't fast enough, right? So let's turn the look ahead up a little bit. Let's do like 0.2 milliseconds. Okay, now we're finally seeing a truly controlled peak and a new envelope shape being cut into the, uh, a new envelope being cut into the signal. So here's the original envelope over here. Let's just compare them side by side. Okay, so this is, what, this is what I was kind of referring to earlier. When we need to reshape drums to be more peaky, uh, more punchy, and less boomy, this is typically how we do it, is with some kind of compressor to reshape it with a new envelope. And you can see in a compressor like Pro C, you can see the envelope that it's carving into the signal right up here in red, right? Fast attack, slow release, fast attack, slow release, and there's a curve to the release. Um, so we're not going to go into compressors. <laughs> go watch other videos for compressors. But the point is, the compressor literally changes everything about the drum. 
Okay. Now, by contrast, a clipper works in a very different way. Let's just turn this whole thing off. Let's bring uh, saturate in. All right. So if we use a clipper instead, all the compressors are off. And now we're just going to use a clipper and we're going to hard clip. And watch what happens over here. Let's say I want to shave everything down to this line right here. And I don't want to change anything else about the kick. Nothing about its timbral qualities. I don't want to take any peak of any sort that's underneath this line. I don't want to change those in any way. I just want to take a laser beam and crack it right across those peaks right there. Okay, that's what we're going to try and do. So I'm just going to kick up the drive until that happens. Okay, so we're doing about two and a half dB of gain reduction with a hard clipper. And let's just turn it on and off and see how it sounds different. So here it is off. Okay, so normally you would not just clip a kick like this, not like this, because the kick itself is already fine. But even so, it's not distorting it that badly, all things considered. If anything, it's giving a little more top click to it, and it's kind of enhancing the boom just a slight bit. But it's also making it soft. It's also making it a little flabby. The boom and the initial crack and knock isn't quite as tight. So this is why um, this is effectively what over over reduction of dynamic range sounds like when you overdo it, when you do it the wrong way to the wrong things. Because again, you would never really take a kick like this and do clipping directly on this kick. Where clipping becomes important and where it becomes useful is when you start summing different sounds together so that they end up looking really, really caterpillar-like, like this. And, you know, a lot of DAWs don't have built-in oscilloscopes, so you're not aware of this unless you stop and print your tracks to audio, like flatten it to audio and look at the audio. And most of you don't do that. That's why a lot of people throw a compressor on. They see their, their uh, channel's peak meter go down a little bit, and they think, well, I guess that's all I can push the peaks down, when they really could push them down a lot more if they were using the right tool. But, uh, you know, most people just listen and look at their track meters, and they don't really understand what any given process is doing to their wave shape. That's why I love oscilloscopes, and oscilloscopes are all over my projects, because I like to see what's happening to the wave. And... I know a lot of you don't have Bitwig, so there are free oscilloscopes out there that let you do the same thing. One is called uh, Smexoscope, right? So we can see this thing on and off, for example. Um, and uh, there's also another one out there called Signalizer. Look for it, Signalizer 64. And I'm playing a different track. Let me go back to this track real quick. Okay, so this is a free oscilloscope. It's really good. It has a nice feature I like where you can make different frequency ranges be different colors, kind of like a lot of DJ software. Uh, and that can be useful for sound design. So if you don't have a DAW that already has a really good oscilloscope like Bitwig does, um, go look for Signalizer. It's free, I think. And uh, I know for sure Smexoscope is free, and both of them will let you see the full waveform in real time without having to print your, your stuff out to um, uh, a flattened track of some sort. Another reason I really like the Bitwig oscilloscope is it lets me look at things in a mid and side together. So here we are on this track. And, you know, I can see how wide the sides are versus the mids. And that's a good visual indicator of whether I've got mono compatibility or, or if I'm making full use of the stereo field. So 
Bitwig hits the sweet spot for me, but sometimes I use these other ones too. Okay, so let's go back to this one one more time. We've shown that a limiter and a hard clipper both make this sound really good and very transparently. Why is the, a straight up hard clipper able to sound just as good as a professional limiter set correctly, right? How does that happen? Well, this is gonna be a provocative statement. It's not true of every limiter. Certainly it's not true of older analog limiters or analog model limiters, but all of the newer brick wall digital limiters, Ozone, FabFilter Pro L, uh, tons of others I'm not gonna name, Elevate, uh, any brick wall limiter that's capable of just saying, take the signal right up to the ceiling and stop. Don't let anything go over a certain ceiling value. Every one of those limiters, they work by having a clipper hidden at the very end of them. Really let that sink in. A lot of times what a, what a modern professional brick wall limiter in, in your DAW, like Pro-L or whatever, what it's doing is it's giving you two or three stages of dynamic range control. And the first stage usually is carving a kind of envelope into the signal, performing a, a kind of final amount of gluing. And then a lot of peaks, a lot of transient peaks will sneak through that, especially if you have oversampling on because oversampling will always overshoot whatever basic ceiling value you're trying to set. It's just the way oversampling works. And then to control those things that slipped through, at the very end, there's a hard clipper or a mostly hard clipper, right? And they just hide this from you. Like, let's go look at Pro-L. If you go look at Pro-L, there's no setting in the advanced channel that talks about clippers at all, right? But there is a clipper here, especially since I have oversampling on. I know for a fact it's going over my ceiling value of zero under the covers, but then it's using a clipper to come along and shave off those peaks that went over zero. Also, with my fairly slow um, initial attack setting, you have to get way down into the sub 0.1 millisecond range to start working more like a clipper. Anything above 0.1 milliseconds, anything going up this way, uh, is letting a lot of transient peaks through, just like with all those compressors I showed you. And so something's gotta shave those off at the end or we're not gonna be able to like stay under zero. Okay, so all modern limiters, brick wall limiters, have a clipper hidden at the end. They don't give you any control over it, most of them. Now there is one exception. Uh, the thing I talked about in my last video, this um, mas newer mastering limiter called Elevate by Newfangled Audio and Eventide, they basically expose everything they're doing at every part of the, the process from start to finish, and you can see They've got a clipper at the end and they give you a lot of control over the clipper. They let you set the shape of the clipper. It looks just like Saturate. In fact, this is where Saturate came from. Is it, it, everyone said, wow, that's such a great clipper. Give us this in a standalone plugin. So you can go from hard to soft. You can control how, how hard you're driving it after all the other earlier stages of the limiter. And then you can put this final clipper on there and drive it for a little extra heat and hotness if you want. Uh, you can make it a, a clean, transparent hard clipping or a more boomy, round, muddy, flabby kind of soft clipping. But sometimes that sounds good on a whole mix, right? It just warms up a mix a little bit. So you have your choice and they give you full control of this, but most limiters don't give you this. So this is why when I just hard clip this track versus running it through Pro-L, it sounded the same because a lot of what Pro-L is actually doing to this track is just clipping transients. It's doing a very small amount of like gain envelope carving. Let's, let's look at what it's doing here. We're gonna open it up and watch what it's actually doing to the signal. So watch this red trace line up here for the gain reduction. Okay, so you can see 
certain transients it pushes down by different amounts, but it's carving a release shape after it pushes it down. There's a thing that goes up slowly and curves out. And that's very controllable with these three knobs here. But the point is it's carving a new dynamic envelope into the signal first. But a lot of things are slipping through. And then at the end, after all that, a clipper is just laser beaming everything off right at the top zero line, because that's where my ceiling is set, is at zero dB, right? OK. So if you know that brick wall limiters use clippers at the end of them, and they're shaving tons of transients, and they still sound clean and transparent, maybe that makes you feel a little bit better about just straight up tossing a hard clipper onto something and using it to do whatever. I mean, again, here's, here's that hard clipper just shaving that, this purple track. Uh, helps if I actually switch to it. Every time it hits this part of the line and goes over, it's just lopping it off. Let's see what that actually looks like. Uh, we're going to leave this on the clipper, and we're going to open up Signalizer. And I'm going to zoom in in Signalizer to let you see those shaved off peaks. And I'm going to periodically freeze the waveform and hover my mouse over the peaks that have been shaved off. And we're talking not just drum peaks, not just percussion peaks, but you're going to see it's cutting into, uh, it's going to be clipping some tonal content, some, some notes and some melodies and some bass sounds. OK, so here we go. Okay, right there, see that thing that's squared off? This is, this is the line where it's clipping. If I turn on this measurement cursor, you can see it's right about 60B right there. That's 60B. So right there, it's cutting things off. Uh, everything else we see here is below it, but let's keep going. Okay, here's a louder signal. It's being shaved hard right there. Everything else is underneath it. That's being shaved a little bit. That's clearly that little transient's being shaved a little bit. Here's a bunch that are being shaved, right? And you don't hear it. You can't hear it. That little tiny bit of distortion that's so momentary, so brief, it's basically like adding little teeny white noise spits on top of the sound. And so it's just adding, if anything, a, a slight touch of brightness. It's, if anything, it's making some things pop a little more. And the whole trick is, if you're not cutting into tonal content, like, like these red colors, this is low frequency content. The pink color is mid-range frequency content. And even though I'm cutting into some low frequency content here, because I'm not doing it too much and the cuts are so short, so tiny, you don't hear it. It's only when you start like way cutting into this entire waveform. Like if I were to, to cram everything down to here and start clipping it off, it would sound very tubby and fuzzy and soft. It would start losing all of its qualities. But you can do a tiny bit of clipping, even into tonal content, as long as it's not doing it too often to everything, and it'll sound really transparent. And, you know, the, the basic idea is we're just trying to clip uh, the larger peaks. So let's turn this off again and freeze it. Okay, like this is a drum hit mostly in here. And you can come down here and shave off most of those higher peaks of the drum hit. And as long as you're not shaving down into the tonal stuff that comes afterward, it's going to sound really transparent. OK, so there's your key is like, don't overdo it. Just shave the bigger transient peaks. And again, transients are a little easier to see down here in an oscilloscope like Smexoscope. Like for this kind of work, I tend to prefer Smexoscope or the uh, Bitwig. Clipper. So Smexoscope also has a nice cursor you can drag around and see actual dB values here. So here's a trick if you use Smexoscope. Play your signal. Oh. 
And as you're playing the signal, try and, and discern with your eyes, like you should know what kick and snare transients and shapes look like, right? Try and understand where the kicks start bleeding into all the tonal content underneath, all the bass content and the synthesizers and whatever. And just drag this cursor down and find that line that's just above the tonal content or just barely touching the tonal content. And then once you've done that, look over here at this value that says Y negative 4.45 dB. So theoretically, if I wanted to make controlling this track as ultimately transparent as possible, I would have stopped at about four and a half dBs of gain reduction. But I was able to go down even further, all the way down to, uh, let's bring it to about negative six here, right? So let's see where this line is sitting. See, most of this low stuff below the line is where all the tonal content is. So we're not cutting into it. We're cutting into the percussive content for the most part. And so that's why it sounds so transparent and sounds just as good as the limiter. So again, clippers used correctly, and most importantly, use hard clipping. Let me show you what this sounds like if we start soft clipping it. Uh, and I'm also gonna show you one other little trick about clippers here. All right, so we're gonna open up Saturate and we're hard clipping. And if I phase cancel this, and the way you phase cancel anything that has lag in it, like there's about 22 milliseconds of lag in um, clippers, thereabouts, right? And limiters too. What you do is you, you throw it in a, um, some sort of parallel effects rack and you, you throw a duplicate copy down here, same exact clipper, right? And then you just turn it off and then you throw in a tool or utility and do the phase invert so that if I play these two tracks together, it's basically going to cancel the original signal. But both of these have the same amount of latency, so they're in sync, they're in phase with each other. And so we can hear what is kind of the, the, the net effect of this clipper in a hard clipping mode on this track, right? So here it is normally, and here it is phase canceled. So it's just like static, little pops of static here and there. White noise, uh, trending down into like the three and 4K range where, where you get the, the deeper body or part of that, that noisy pop, that distortion. But that's the distortion being caused by all those tiny little short peaks being clipped. And you can hear how quiet it is. It barely adds anything to the original signal because it's so quiet. Okay, so let's do some soft clipping now. Let's hear what happens when we soft clip this whole mix. I'm gonna go from the extremes of fully hard to fully soft, just so you can really fundamentally hear the difference. So watch what happens. The difference is very subtle in this case because we're not clipping too heavily. We're still only staying up in this high frequency, punchy, transient part of the signal. That's the only thing we're touching with this. So you're not going to hear a lot of difference between hard and soft in this case. Um, let's hear what it sounds like canceled hard versus soft. So this is the hard spitty poppy. Okay, now, what you should have heard, and I'll play it back for you and turn it up just a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I'll turn it up a little bit so you can hear it. Um, this is just high-frequency transient static, but as soon as I took it fully soft, you started hearing a little, little hint of tonal content in the, you know, the differential signal. So it's starting to touch 
the bass frequencies and the synths and other things. And that's because the way soft clipping works is it's like, okay, this says keep the volume 100% perfectly linear, just like the original, until you hit a certain threshold and then just chop it off like a laser beam, right? But as soon as you start putting a knee in that, it says, well, before you get to the threshold, we're gonna change the volume a little bit. We're gonna start dropping the volume gently here and a little more here and even a little more here. And then it's only when we get to the threshold that we then just completely crank the volume down to nothing, right? And the more soft your curve is, the earlier you start changing the volume. And so signals that are way down under those peaks are now being turned down. Like signals way under the peaks are being turned down a little bit. Signals a little bit under the peak are being turned down a lot more. Signals close to the peak are almost being hard clipped, almost down to zero. And then finally, when you get to the peak, it's hard clipped. So see, soft clipping is gonna start affecting sounds below the level you're trying to shave off peaks at. So soft clipping, in a way similar to compressors, will start changing the timbre of the sound. And the net effect is that it typically makes things a little warmer and darker and tubbier sounding, right? It takes that, that bright edge off, that spitty, static edge, and it makes it a little deeper in, in certain ways. And that may be pleasant. I mean, that's the whole idea of saturation and why we use saturators all over the place. But when you're in a mastering context and a mixing context, you typically don't wanna just start fundamentally changing the sound of your entire mix or your entire group bus. Typically, you wanna stay transparent. And so hard clipping is super transparent because it only changes and affects anything above the threshold. Everything below the threshold is completely untouched and 100% linear. So let me hear you, let, let me let you hear that difference. I'm gonna do this again, but I'm gonna turn up the gain on this whole container just so you can hear it a little better. Okay. So it takes the staticky distortion down, but it starts changing the volume and timbre and volume relationships of everything way below the threshold. So it's a trade-off and you can do it all completely by ear, but I'll just tell you theoretically, conceptually, if you want the most transparent result possible, use your hip clippers in 100% hard clipping mode. Okay, so that's the big picture on the clipper. If you wanna quit now, you could quit, but let me show you one more thing. Um, actually, let me show it to you in Bitwig first. So I'm gonna open up my project template. This is my standard template going into this year. And look how fast Bitwig loads a huge template. This template is, is ridiculously huge. Look at this thing. I've got so many devices already in this template, so many tracks and groups. Um, and I haven't activated all of these plugins yet, but watch how fast it activates. You're gonna see a little thing under my logo right here, a little blip where it tells me it's loading the plugins. Okay, it's loading them. And it's done. That's how fast Bitwig loads huge, ridiculously huge project templates. All you Ableton Live people should be jealous. Um, so this template, as my standard template, it's chock full of stuff. I basically um, have lots of individual tracks that are all grouped in various ways that let me do high level processing on every group. Most of what you're looking here, most of what you're looking at here are group buses. Okay, and on almost every group bus, you can see I have a clipper right here. On this bus, I have a clipper. On this bus, I have a clipper. Every single group, this bus, is there a clipper? Yep, there's the clipper, right? And after every clipper, I have an oscilloscope because I like to use the oscilloscope to help me set the clipper by seeing, is it peaky enough? Does it even need clipping? Okay, if I have big peaks, let's try shaving them with the clipper. Let's see how that sounds. Let's turn the clipper on and off and see if it's affecting the sound in a bad way. And so I do all this clipping on every single bus, all the way up, not the sub bus. You, you don't want to clip a sub, right? 
but all my drum tops, all of my synth sounds that could be really bitey and, and transient, right? Uh, all my atmospheric sounds, um, certainly drum tops are gonna have a clipper right here. Uh, of course, my kick and my snare, the two most important sounds in almost every track, they use a clipper. And then, you know, all of these groups, as you, as you work up this way, this green group for synths, you know, everything's being grouped into synths, and then synths are being summed with the subs and the drum tops and the kick and the snare into this other group called the instrumental, right? And then the instrumental is being summed with my vocals. And then these two things are summed and finally sent on to the master, right? So I've got this cascade rolling upward from all these tracks to their, their parent groups. The parent groups are grouped into bigger groups and so on all the way up. And at almost every stage of the instrumental stuff, I've got clippers on almost every bus. We can look at it this way in the mixer view. And again, working backward from the lower level here, Clipper, 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 clipper. Skipping the subs, clipper on the drum tops. Don't need it down here. Need it on the group bus for the kick and snare. There's the clipper there. There's the clipper on the entire instrument sum, right? And then over on my master, uh, I have a lot of things hiding in my mastering chain. And if I were to open this up and show it to you, you would see two different clippers inside of this mastering chain. So that's clippers everywhere in the project. Now, why do I do this? This is actually something I did differently in 2019, and it was only recently that some of my colleagues convinced me to do otherwise. I thought for a long time, mistakenly, that um, you only needed to clip once or twice right, way at the top level of the project, like run everything up to the mix bus, do all your early mix bus processing and your EQ and your coloring and your stereo widening and all the stuff you do on the mix bus, right? And then when you're all done with all that, if there's any, you know, spiky caterpillar peaks sitting above the waveform, just, just trim those down before you feed it into the final limiter. Um, because then the limiter doesn't have to work very hard and you can do two or three or four decibels of gain reduction and hit your loudness target, right? Instead of having to do six or eight or nine or 10 to try and hit that loudness target. Because if you, if you push more than 6 dB into a mastering limiter, even with the best mix, that mix is gonna start falling apart after 6 dB of gain reduction. And ideally, you really don't wanna go more than three dB of gain reduction on a mastering limiter, right? And so if you control all those peaks but just before you send everything into the mastering limiter, the limiter doesn't have to work as hard. When it does see a peak, it only has to push it down a little bit instead of pushing it down a lot and pushing down all the other sounds near it and cutting into all these other sounds after it pushes down that peak with its release envelope, right? That's what you don't wanna have happening in your mastering limiter and that's where most of you who don't know about clippers get stuck. You can only push your song so hard into a mastering, lim mastering limiter and it starts sounding soft and distorted and flabby and tubby and just dies, and you go, ah, how do I get this louder? Well, you get it louder by controlling all those peaks before you even hit the mastering limiter, right? Okay, so I used to just do it one time before the mastering limiter, but one of my crewmates in producer Dojo is a smart cookie, and we were having an argument about this internally, and they said, no, 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 you wanna clip lots of little clips everywhere and not all at once. And we argued and they posted some very good video proof and I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel because these are excellent videos by an excellent producer. So what I'm gonna do is link in uh, the comments for my video. I'm going to link this special unlisted video. This is private stock just among my producer collective. Uh, he, uh, Nick has allowed me to, to do this. <laughs> He's given me his blessings. So this is a short five minute video that shows the theoretical problem with trying to clip all at once, just once way up high in your project. This is theoretical using sine waves. It's not really anything you'll run into in the real world, but it's a good theoretical basis. It's only five minutes long, give it a watch. And then when you're done watching that one, I'll also have a link to this unlisted video by Nick and um, 
Here, he shows it in like, okay, real world clipping on all of your group tracks and how much distortion you end up with at the end if you do lots of little clipping on each group bus and before they're summed up at the master versus summing everything first and then doing one single round of clipping up on the master. And this again, it's a short video, it's only 11 minutes. Give both of these a watch, you will be very educated. <laughs> he does a great job of explaining the problem here. So Nick, thank you. Nick convinced me that I should be putting clippers everywhere. Uh, and we're in good company because what I want to show you now is, let's see, let's see. I'm going to go look for Skrillex Mumbai Power. Okay. So some of you may have seen this one. Skrillex recently put out a video showing their project folder for Mumbai Power as they kind of demoed the track. And so a lot of people, uh, certainly quite a few people in my collective, geeked out on this, looked at it really hard, tried to figure out how Skrillex did their busing and routing. And we deconstructed it and we talked about it. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about clippers that came up because of this, because Skrillex is also using clippers in quite a few places in this project file. And to make it simple for you, this is a, if you were to, Skrillex uses some old style bus routing techniques that are like old school, where you just make separate dedicated tracks and call them a bus and manually route things to them. And you don't have to do that these days in all the modern DAWs that let you group tracks together, um, like Ableton or Bitwig. So if you were to redo Skrillex's project from Mumbai Power and use his names for his buses, these green things were the names of his main processing buses. Um, if you did it as tracks feeding into groups and then certain groups summing together into a, a higher level group and then being summed with other things and then summing into a higher level group and so on, just like I showed you in my template. Uh, and my template, I, I actually got most of the ideas for my template from my own experience and also uh, from, um, oh gosh, oh gosh, what's his name? Stefan Reed, the realest puppet in the game. He did a really good video once about his bus routing approach and I liked his concepts and I tried his concepts early last year and really liked them. So m my bus, my project template that I showed you is basically more or less Reed Stefan's approach with my own little variations. And Skrillex almost uses the same approach as me or Reed, right? It, a lot of the same conceptual ideas are grouped and cascaded in the same way. So it's very similar. And again, we did the deconstruction for you, and I'll just show you what we found out. Skrillex has a hard clipper on their basic chain at the very end. They have a, a hard clipper on their comp chain. Um, they didn't seem to do it. Yeah, they skipped the sub bass, of course, right? That's what they call their hype chain. So on all their drop sounds and melodic sounds, they had a clipper at the summing point there, hard clipper. On their chain that was both the sub and the basic chain, they used some hard clipping, maybe hype, no, hype fed into comp. So I think it was just the idea was the sub bass frequency should be far enough below these that it wouldn't be affected by a clipper up here. I do it slightly different. I keep my sub bases out of any clipping path entirely um, for the most part. And then, you know, up here they summed other things with the, uh, the tonal content, the melodic content. They summed their percussive and sound effects content together and had another round of hard clipping on the pre-master. And then, of course, up on the master at various points, they had another round of hard clipping before it went into their limiter. So the point is... Well, I'm not the only one telling you to do this. Other names you should care about, do this. All right, so this is the point where you can bug out if you want to stop, because Baffy runs long and Baffy likes to go into very deep dive detail. But now some of you are going to be asking me, what is the best clipper? So I'm going to move into a discussion about the best clipper. Stay if you want, leave if you don't want. I personally think the best clipper overall these days is Saturate by Eventide. 
Not everyone's going to like this clipper because it requires iLock software protection. You don't need a USB, you can use software only iLock protection, but I know a lot of us hate that, even the software version. Your mileage may vary whether you decide it's worth it to get Saturate, but I think Saturate sounds noticeably better than every other clipper out there. Now, that said, you only hear the difference when you're really driving something hard, when you're really pushing the limits of how far you should clip something. If you are doing a reasonable amount of peak shaving on just percussive transient peaks, and you're doing a reasonable amount of clipping on every single group on the way up to your master bus, you're not going to hear any real significant difference between Saturate and other clippers, many of which are free, okay? So, and don't have copy protection. So let's talk about that now. I'm going to pivot into that. Thanks for hanging with me this far. And if you want to stay with me, I'm guessing we have about 10 or 15 or 20 more minutes to go here. All right. So we're going to flip over now to this project. And here I'm just going to show you four clippers, four of the better clippers that I like. I like all of them. I use, I use Saturate the most, but uh, I like all these clippers. And I'm going to demo some things for you with sine waves and also with uh, kick and snare drums just to, just to show you how clippers aren't all the same and how there are some fairly significant differences between them. So let's start with this hard clipping track here. I have a tone generator putting out a 100 hertz sine wave. Uh, this is what it sounds like. Let me turn off the clipper for a second. Okay, we're not going to listen to it most of the time. We're just going to look at the waveform and look at it in a frequency analyzer. And I've got, uh, I like this particular frequency analyzer for looking really carefully at aliasing foldback and detailed um, harmonics. You can, you can, the M analyzer, which is free, by the way, and so is the M oscilloscope. Um, you can make this really granular with the right settings over here. Okay, so this is just the single 100 hertz sine tone and all this wiggle stuff down here is way below the, the threshold of hearing. I've, I've purposely gone way deep. Normally this clipper, I'm sorry, this analyzer by default would be set to about 80 decibels as, as its floor. So normally a 100 hertz tone would look like this just a single 100 hertz sine wave. Great, everything's good. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the, the surface, way down, way, way, way far from full scale. Um, but you can't hear it. You, you can't even hear it this far. You can't even really hear it this far. I mean, this is like, you would have to crank up the volume or the gain on a channel so high to hear whatever's happening even down here. But whether you know it or not, Almost all processes, almost all DAWs and signals and whatever have all this crap going on way down at the f absolute minimum floor, right? Look at all that noise down there, all this crazy stuff, okay? But it's completely inaudible. So normally we don't care or worry about any of this. But I'm going to set this just to really show you what's going on with clippers and how they work. I'm going to set this at 120, 128. And we're going to take a look way below the threshold of hearing at some things that are going on down here that are interesting. Okay, so here's our basic sine wave, and we are going to turn on a clipper. So we are now using standard clip, which was my favorite clipper until Saturate came out. This is, this is everyone, everyone who really understands clippers always talks about standard clip as being, quote unquote, the best largely because it has oversampling, and oversampling solves a problem. Um, however, I think a lot of people misunderstand some things about its oversampling, <laughs> and that in most real-world use cases, it's not really solving the problem that you try to solve with oversampling, but that's what I'm going to get into. We're going to do a little theoretical demonstration here. So we're taking that sine wave, we're giving it three decibels of clipping, or gain reduction, it's represented by this, you know, it's completely linear right up to negative three, oops, 
clicked into that mode, right up to negative three, and then it flatlines. And you know, this is where the original signal would go if it could have been still going linear all the way to zero. So it's a really nice visualization. Uh, and we are doing oversampling on this, and we have the ceiling on so that it is absolutely positively 100% stopping the signal at negative three dB below full scale, okay? And what we see in the uh, spectrum analyzer, we have a set of harmonics walking down this way, and they're all odd harmonics, 100, 300, 500, 700, 900, and so on. If I, if I hover over every one of these peaks, it's always a, an odd multiplier of the original signal. Those are odd harmonics. So what a clipper does when you push a signal into a virtual ceiling, and say that signal cannot go any louder and just stop it cold and level it off, shear it off, you get a series of odd harmonics. That's what clippers do. That's what saturators do. If I were to take a standard clip and make it more of a soft clip setting, we'll just flip over here to the old classic style soft clip and um, you know soften it up. You still get those harmonics. They're still all pretty much mostly odd harmonics, but the, the shape and proportion of them to the original fundamental and some of the early most audible harmonics changes compared to hard clipping. But we're softening up that curve and, you know, it changes the sound. Um, let's go back to hard clipping. Um, now, here's the important part. What is what are these little peaks bouncing back in this direction and going angling downward from here and then angling downward this way? What is that about? This is called aliasing. This is aliasing foldback. When you hear the word aliasing artifacts or aliasing foldback or just aliasing, people are talking about this phenomenon. And it's just a simple limitation of digital. My project rate is 44.1 kilohertz. And basically, digital works by going twice the sampling rate, so up to 88 something. And then there's a little filter right at um, 22 kilohertz. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Let me back that up. I misspoke. I am at 44.1 sample rate, 44.1 thousand. 44,100 sample rate, 44.1K. And everything above half of that distance, 22K, everything above 22K is being filtered off by a kind of filter at the end. And it's just the nature of that filter and it's the nature of digital information that any kind of frequencies that sit above um, 22 kilohertz, up in the ultrasonic range above human hearing, any kind of frequencies above that halfway point, which is called the Nyquist frequency, you probably heard of that, anything above the Nyquist frequency, it can't just disappear off into thin air when it's recorded in digital bits. We have to capture the information about those frequencies somewhere. And so what happens is they literally bounce backward like they're bouncing off of a mirror right at the point where, you know, that halfway point for your sample rate at the Nyquist frequency. They bounce backward and reflect into the audible range of the spectrum again. So this entire set of harmonics you see bouncing down this way and eventually decaying down here like a, like a diagonal line moving this way, those were actually created way up in the ultrasonic range by this clipper. When you shave off a signal that hard in a nonlinear way and generate all these odd harmonics, they march way, way, way out into the ultrasonic range. But since they can't go anywhere in the digital realm, they get bounced back into the audible range. And this is called aliasing. And here's the important point. If I hover really carefully, this particular harmonic is at 500 hertz. This one is at 700 hertz, right? This one in the middle that got bounced back from way up high, that is originally an odd harmonic way up in the ultrasonic range, but it's just the nature of 
this project and this frequency that when it bounces back in, it's bouncing back as an even ordered harmonic. It's an even multiple of 100, not an odd multiple of 100. So it's 600, and this one's going to be 800, and this one's going to be 1,000, and so on. So we're getting a mixture of odd harmonics and even harmonics bouncing back as aliasing artifacts. And so it's kind of effectively, if you could hear this, <laughs> it would fundamentally change the timbre of this particular kind of distortion that the Clipper's causing. Now, here's the deal. This is all very theoretical, and all of this stuff is sitting way below that audible range of like 60, 70, 80 decibels, right? If I go up here and, you know, make this look more normal and set this at 80, which is, you know, maybe those of you with really good hearing who have cranked up your monitors or headphones super high, you might hear things that are happening way down here. But look, as soon as I push this up to 80, do you see those aliasing artifacts? No, you don't. They're below the real limits of our hearing. They're so tiny, so small, so infinitesimal that they don't affect the sound at all, right? So it's real easy for those of us who start learning about some of the physics and, and some of the, the tricks and gotchas of various processing techniques. We go, oh, aliasing artifacts, bad. Even if they're inaudible, even if they're way below the limit of hearing, that's bad. You don't want that in your project. I mean, that's like where dithering noise lives and oh, you have to pick the right kind of dithering noise and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, no, not really. This stuff is so unimportant in certain ways. Now, I am oversimplifying a little because yes, if you're summing a whole bunch of different tracks with a bunch of nasty aliasing artifacts in them, and if those aliasing artifacts sound bad and are causing intermodulation distortion, which is the bad kind of distortion that sounds very sour and unmusical, well, yeah, if, you're, if you've got a bunch of low-level stuff like this and it's all getting summed together 10 times towards the mastering bus and then you, you squash it up to a real loud master at the very end, then yeah, some of these things might finally push up into a more audible range. But everything else is also going to be so loud that still, by comparison, this stuff is masked. It's masked. It's kind of inconsequential, kind of, mostly, okay? So I think my main point here is that even though there is aliasing distortion in, in the particular settings we have for this right now, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about it. You're never going to hear it, right? It just, I guess at some level, it contributes to the overall sound or character of standard clip. All right? So now I'm going to move on to the next thing, which I know those of you who are familiar with Standard Clip are going to say, no, 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 Standard Clip is the best because you can get rid of that aliasing stuff. And you're right, you can. All you have to do is turn off the ceiling. The minute I turn off the ceiling, all those aliasing foldback artifacts go away because Standard Clip features oversampling. And what we're saying here is, no, 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 don't, don't try and do all this inside of a 44.1 frequency range right, with the Nyquist at 22 kilohertz. Instead, make that huge. Make it a 320,000 sample frequency range. Multiply it by eight times. Make it huge. And let these odd harmonics roll way, way, way up into the ultrasonic range. And then we're going to set a Nyquist filter way up at 160,000 hertz. Like, nobody can hear that high. That's where we're going to put the filter. And the frequencies that manage to go past 160,000 hertz will bounce backward from that Nyquist filter. But they're never going to reach the audible range. They just peter out way, way, way off to the left of my screen somewhere. I'm sorry, the right of my screen somewhere. So you never hear them. This is oversampling. This is why oversampling is so important. This is why plugins that have oversampling settings often, often, not always, it's a good idea to use them. <laughs> because you'll get much cleaner results that way. But here's the problem. Yes, theoretically, standard clip can be set up so that it can clip with nothing but odd harmonics and zero any, any. if I were to go all the way to the noise floor, you would not see any aliasing foldback, right? Because we turned the ceiling off. But here's the thing, and I'll, I'll demo this in a minute in a different way on the drum tracks, but oversampling, 
make your peaks go above whatever threshold you've set. Just take that as a given. Whenever you use a thing that has oversampling and that thing also has some sort of ceiling level somewhere in it, even though you've set a ceiling, in this case at negative three decibels, I absolutely have signal peaks going over negative three decibels now because of oversampling. The minute you put on any kind of process that says you have to absolutely stop that signal at a certain ceiling value, the minute you do that, you have aliasing artifacts again. It's just the nature of the beast because it has to do something with your digital sample rate and make sure absolutely nothing goes over zero. So even though we have oversampling on, we've got aliasing up like crazy. Okay, so all you people that want to say, no, 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 standard clip is way better than saturate because aliasing and oversampling, I'm going to say no, not in the real world, because in the real world, you're typically going to have that ceiling on. All right. Now, it is true. If I turn off all the oversampling, watch what happens to the amount and height of the aliasing foldback. I'm going to turn it off. And you can see that all the aliasing foldback jumps up a little bit higher. Right? And it starts doing this weird waffling kind of oscillation. Right? Now, if I go turn on the oversampling again and put it up somewhat high, really past four or eight doesn't get any better, you're going to see this line drop down again. Okay? So it is true, it's absolutely true, that even if you have a hard ceiling, using some oversampling will reduce the aliasing artifacts, but it will not get rid of them. They're still there. But even, even with aliasing artifacts, that's so far below the, the audible range. Who cares? Really, theoretically, who cares? In, in practical terms, rather. Okay, so let's look at newfangled saturate. Now you've, you've got all the basics about aliasing and stuff. So newfangled, which we are using in a hard clip mode. Again, 100% hard clip, 3 dB of gain reduction. And it's doing odd harmonics. It has its aliasing foldback of even harmonics, just like standard clip. The aliasing is a little higher than standard clip if I go back and forth. right? Standard clip's a little lower, saturate's a little higher. So those of you who work in the theoretical realm and think theory means everything and real world sound doesn't outweigh the theory, you might say, well, clearly standard clip is better because it has less aliasing foldback than saturate. Saturate's just dirtier and messier and worse sounding. Well, again, I'm gonna demonstrate why that's not the case later and why this stuff is inconsequential. You do not need to care about it. What is interesting about saturate compared to standard clip is what's happening with the first series of odd order harmonics that march their way towards the end of the audible spectrum, the audible frequency range, right? A nice, even, linear procession of harmonics with a couple weird dips. That's natural. A few little places where it kind of drops down underneath, but it's mostly linear, right? The high frequency distortion that is being added by these harmonics is a little bit heavier than the original fundamental in the first couple very audible, very loud harmonics, right? There's a lot of density here, up high in volume relative to the original. Now with saturate, the balance is a little different. It's the same basic line to here, but you notice that starting at a certain point, every other harmonic has a little bit of a dip below the general trend line, and it, it keeps dipping down more and more and more this way. What's going on here is a special kind of post-clipping filter that Dan Gillespie has built into Saturate. And he did this for a very specific reason. I'm gonna briefly go to the Saturate uh, website, or well, the Eventide website. And if you go look at the details for Saturate, and you scroll to the bottom, take a really close look at this paragraph you can freeze the screen and read it. I'm not going to read it out to you and, and waste more time. But the basic idea is a lot of saturators, when you push them hard, like slightly past their limit of transparency, they start sounding tubby. 
They start sounding muddy. They start sounding wonky. They start sounding soft. And Dan Gillespie tried really hard with Saturate to use some very different post-filtering techniques and spectral filtering techniques to make it pretty much not sound tubby ever and to really sound as similar as possible to the original timbre of the original sound. And they did a great job, and it's why I use Saturate, because it is the best, most transparent sounding saturator that you can push way farther before it starts softening up and obviously distorting and obviously making something boomy or bassy like a kick drum sound too tubby and too um, muddy, right? So part of the way they're doing that is with some careful use of filtering that's changing the balance of the harmonics against the originals and yada, yada, yada. Okay, we're going to look at another saturator now. Standard clip is very cheap. Newfangled saturate is a little more expensive. Free clip is um, completely free. It's made by Venn Audio. And it's a little less configurable. It kind of basically has one hard setting and five or so soft settings, and it does have oversampling, and you can choose to either have a ceiling after the oversampling or no ceiling. Like in this case, we're using eight times oversampling with hard clipping, hard clipping at 3 dB, which is set right here. And we said, don't put a ceiling clipper at the end, right? So. Here we still see aliasing foldback, but it's fairly quiet, right? And it's moving around a little bit. Now, if I, if I turn on this setting that says, do clip it at the ceiling value, so we're clipping to 3 dB, we want it to absolutely stop the signal at 3 dB. Watch what happens to the height of this aliasing foldback as I kick this in. Okay, see how it jumped up and got louder? So again, um, like standard clip, free clip gives you some options for oversampling, and it is better than not having oversampling. Technically, it will reduce the aliasing fallback, but regardless, you're going to have a little bit of aliasing fallback. And again, it's so far below the noise floor, who cares? Well, not the noise floor, but below the audible hearing range. It's completely masked. It, it, it never is an issue. So free clip is a really good clipper. It's free. It's a great hard clipper. If you don't have standard clip or, or saturate or anything like that, try free clip. It'll get the job done. Everything I've talked about in this video up till now, you can do just fine with free clip. It'll sound great. If you're not overdoing it, free clip gets the job done very transparently. And I'll demo that in a minute. I'll, I'm going to let you hear all these. First, I wanted to talk about fundamentals. Now, this last one is interesting. It's the Bitwig clipper. It's the one that's built into Bitwig. And Bitwig doesn't have a clipper device. Instead, it's just one module in an FX grid device. So let's open up this grid device. Let's pop this out into its own separate window so you can see it. So it's a thing that's hiding in the level group. It's right here. It's this module called clip. Okay, and it's just a hard clipper. You cannot make it soft. It's a 100% hard clipper. Now, since the grid and everything in a grid device always operates with four times oversampling, we've got audio signal coming in, going through the hard clipper with 3 dB of gain reduction, and then going out again. That's all that's going on here. And you'll notice zero aliasing foldback. You cannot see any aliasing foldback anywhere here. And it also does this interesting dip with the every other odd harmonic as it marches out. It does a filtered dip right here around uh, the 7K range where, where you have a lot of hissy air. It's actually got a dip and then it kind of goes up again. And so it has its own characteristic sound. Again, these differences in the sound are so subtle because most of these different ways of treating the odd harmonics are happening way up in the air range where everything is just hiss. So it's subtle, subtle differences to that white noise sputter or static that you heard earlier in this video. That's all that's going on here. Very, very subtle, tiny differences. Um, now, of course, the problem is since there is no, it's oversampling and there's no way to put a hard ceiling on this, 
that means it's not really stopping the signal at negative three decibels. That means if you push, you know, a percussion track through this and you're trying to say, chop all those peaks off at exactly three dBs, you're gonna have spikes that go over three dB. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute. And that can be okay. It's still gonna do some clipping, but it's not really like as surgical of a clipper as say saturate or standard clip or free clip. So just keep that in mind. So now that we've done the theoretical stuff, let's just hear, hear what these sound like. Let's hear them on a sine wave, which is very artificial, but just, you know, so you can hear what it sounds like. Um, we're gonna turn this up slightly. We're gonna start with the original and then walk through all four clippers and see if you can, if you can even hear, these are all hard clipping. See if you can hear a difference in, in what it's doing to that original 100 Hertz bassy sine wave. Okay, so you heard they all sound pretty much exactly the same, even on a sine wave, which you never want to really clip, <laughs> unless you're doing it for sound design purposes, of course. And in that case, you'd probably want to use a more soft clipper to really give it some color and character. But anyway, just from a theoretical standpoint, all those different transients you saw, different aliasing foldback, and um, I'm sorry, different harmonics and aliasing foldback, Regardless of the subtle differences you see in a graph, in an analyzer, who cares? They all sound the same. That's my point. They sound the same. Now, where clippers start sounding different is when you use them in a soft clipping setting. So here I have the same four clippers, and each one of them, just to show you one, uh, has a basically the 50% midway soft setting, right? Not fully wet, not fully hard, not fully soft, but just right down the middle. So I'm not going to dwell on this too long. Uh, we're going to look really briefly at the analyzer. We're going to see what it looks like when it's clipping it. And we're going to see what the, how the harmonics look a little different. So again, I have standard clip here. Uh, let's see if I got the ceiling on. Yeah, the ceiling's on with oversampling. But you'll notice you don't see any aliasing foldback anymore. You see very little. It's even further down here. And that's one aspect of soft clipping because you're not doing such a drastic and sudden uh, nonlinear shift of the volume from like normal to nothing in, in zero flat because it's a more rounded knee, like a, like a soft knee compressor. It doesn't generate harmonics that go as far out into the ultrasonic range. And so by the time they get into the ultrasonic range, it's already pretty low as it's hitting the top of our, our audible spectrum. And so the bounce back that's happening is way down below the edge of things here. And so you're not hardly getting any aliasing at all. Okay, so that's the first thing to understand is when you use soft clipping, you have less aliasing, which means potentially less sour sounding harmonics. Right? It's all odd harmonics all the way. Every one of these is an odd harmonic. And so that's why soft clipping can sound a little more pleasant and less harsh if it's pushed really hard, right? Okay, now let's look at saturate. Again, same basic shape that it's doing, same rounded shape. There's some subtle differences, right? You can see the curve is a little different here at the knee. I'm gonna go back and forth a couple of times. All right, and you'll also see almost no aliasing fullback, a little bit right here, just a tiny bit right up at the very high frequencies. And again, you know, overall the harmonics are lower compared to everything else. And so that's the other fundamental thing about soft clipping is soft clipping simply increases the balance of the original fundamental and the first few harmonics versus all the higher order harmonics that are brighter and buzzier sounding. Right? So we can see this really well with saturate. This is another reason I love saturate because you can so seamlessly go between hard and soft and watch what happens. Let me pop this down a little bit. 
Okay, let's go full hard. Here's the original hard shape we were looking at. Here's those aliasing artifacts, right? These scary looking aliasing artifacts. Now I'm doing more drive this time. The last time we were only driving it by three decibels. I'm driving harder now. So the aliasing artifacts go up higher. The way that the every other harmonic works looks a little different now. And now it's skipping two harmonics at a time and they're all lower. And again, this is just Dan Gillespie's special filtering, spectral filtering. If I were to go to standard clip, Ah, I don't want to do it. Well, yeah, let's do it. Let's go back to standard clip for a minute. Let me just show you what standard clip does at, at 6 dBs of hard. We're going to flip from soft clip to hard clip. Again, we need to go down 6 decibels. Ah, close enough. So you can see similar things here. The shapes and interleaving of the harmonics now change a little bit right, when it's hard clipped and being pushed all the way to six. Um, but we're gonna undo that, go back to soft clip. Stick this back up at zero. All right, that's back where it was. Um, so anyway, the, one of the things that happens when you go from hard to soft, let's make sure I'm looking at the right channel. Okay, we're looking at saturate again. As we go from hard to soft, all those high order harmonics just keep moving downward in intensity. And with saturate, if you go all the way fully soft, you get this very interesting kind of shape. And again, only the original fundamental and the first few harmonics are emphasized. And so it sounds fundamentally warmer and deeper and bassier, right? And as you go up, it starts getting brighter and buzzier and buzzier. But we're going to go back to 50% because we're comparing all these at their midway point. So a little bit of theory there. So standard clip looks like this, pretty similar to saturate at its midway point. Saturate's a little bit quieter up in the top end. See how some of these ones out here are a little lower than with standard clip. Here's free clip in its sort of midway shape. It's staying a little more linear, but it is lower than hard clipping and uh, the aliasing foldback is a little lower. Here's the shape over here. Saturate, uh, standard clip, saturate, free clip, all pretty similar. And this is what it looks like. And now the bitwig clipper is only a hard clipper, so we're not going to look at the bitwig clipper. So let's hear what these sound like, theoretically speaking. I'm sorry, practically speaking. What does soft clipping sound like and how different are these things? Let's start with the original signal and standard clip. Okay, again, not much difference. Not much difference at all on a sine wave, but this is all very theoretical because we're not usually clipping sine waves. So now let's hear this on a drum track. Let's hear what these clippers do to kicks and snares. And really, we're just gonna focus on kicks because I don't wanna make the video super long by duplicating everything for a kick and then a snare. So here what we have is uh, hard clipping, same four hard clippers, we're sending a kick drum in, uh, and we're going to have before and after oscilloscopes. Let's turn this off entirely and let you hear the kick by itself. Okay, so you can see that the kick has a peaky thing going on. And let's just say we want to shave this down and push it down fairly far. We're going to cut into almost all of this stuff right here. We're going to shave it right down to here because we're going to overdo it to hear what the different clippers sound like when you push them too hard. Remember earlier I said you would you would not usually clip a kick all by itself unless it was really weirdly shaped somehow. Usually, you know, that kick's going to get summed with a bunch of other things. And then in the full mix, big peaks appear above the transient of the kick. And it's really when you clip off those peaks that happen way up here, you're still leaving the original kick kind of alone. Kind of, sort of. 
So let's just overdo it on purpose to hear what clippers sound like on typical material that you're usually gonna clip. But let's hear what they do when they're pushed too hard, right? When you're pushing something like this too hard and you're starting to cut into tonal body content where some sub, sub bassy type frequencies are happening right here. So as we turn this on, and we're gonna do standard clip first, watch over here. Let's unfreeze this. Actually, I'm just gonna leave this so you can just compare this shape with whatever goes on over here. Okay, so right now we're only clipping about 3 dB to this line. And they're all gonna sound pretty much the same. I'm not clipping super hard on these. It's 3 dBs each, I think, is how I set this up. So I'm just gonna walk through them real quick. And let me also, did I put, yeah, no, that's already full volume. Let's do it this way. Yeah, let me get this thing. Let me just turn it up a little bit here. Okay, now even at just 3 dB of clipping, just this first part right here, only that little transient peak and not really touching the rest of the drum, you hear a difference in the sound quality of those clippers. They all sounded slightly different. The timbre was different. Let me um, exaggerate that a little bit now. Let's really bring out that difference so we can, we can hear exactly what these different clippers look like. So we're gonna take this one down to uh, negative six. So now we're gonna do six dB of hard clipping on this one. And we're gonna make sure that the ceiling is also at negative six. Standard clip's a little harder to set up. Saturate's way easier. Okay, now we're gonna go to saturate and change this from 3 dB to 6 dB of drive. And then we're gonna to come to free clip and change this to six dB of drive. And finally the bitwig clipper. Yep, that's the right one. I must have turned that down for some reason. Uh, let's make this 6 dB. Oh, come on. There we go. Six. Okay. So now let's hear all of these driving way too hard. And again, we're going to look at the oscilloscope afterward. You're going to see now it's cutting in closer to this second line here. And now you're gonna start hearing how tubby some of these things make the kick. What I'm gonna do now is turn it on and off, the whole clipping, so you hear the dry kick and then the clipped kick. So let's hear this kick dry. Sorry, I forgot to turn my mic back up. Okay, so I was trying to keep my mic bleed down so you could really hear the differences, but I think you clearly heard the difference in timbres there. Uh, Bitwig's Clipper 
actually was the worst and got the tubbiest in sound. And if you pay attention to the peaks over here, um, let's turn it on again. Look at how there's a little bit of a blip right above this line. See how it, it actually pushed most of the drum lower than the line? And there was a little bit of a transient peak at the beginning of it, right? So that's the problem with oversampling. Oversampling plays games where it isn't just a hard limited ceiling. If we look at free clip, it's gonna be right up to this line flat as a sausage, right? And if we look at saturate, it's gonna be right up against that line flat as a sausage. And with standard clip, it will also be flat as a sausage because in standard clip, we have a ceiling value. And we're saying stop it at the ceiling even though you're using oversampling and same for free clips. So that's why oversampling is not always good, especially on a clipper, especially if you can't set a ceiling value. So hey, if Bitwig devs see this, <laughs> you need to give us a ceiling value on that clipper or some other module that will do an absolute hard clip with a ceiling uh, or something, something. Um, right now, I would never use the Bitwig Clipper specifically because of this. Okay, so let's focus on uh, the two best sounding out of the bunch are Free Clip and Saturate. And actually, Standard Clip sounds a little tubby. Really listen for the tubbiness. I want, I'm going to turn it on and off with Standard Clip and listen to how the, the boomy low end part of the kick softens up and gets mushy and tubby and overwhelming of the high frequencies. I'm gonna turn off the mic and let you really hear it. I'm also gonna turn this up more, make it kind of loud. All right, here we go. Okay, so you hear it got a little a little, how should I put it? Just longer and sloppier and tubbier, right? Now, listen to saturate. And again, we're overdoing this. You shouldn't push a clipper this hard. Uh, you shouldn't push a sound this hard with a clipper. So I'm gonna go back and forth. Okay, so hopefully that was enough. You can replay that part if you want to hear it a few more times. But the basic idea there, if you pay really close attention, you're going to hear that the standard clip had its bass portion kind of overwhelming the higher frequencies. And so the snap and the knock were getting a little bit overwhelmed by a round tubby bottom, right? Whereas saturate was doing a better job of keeping the bottom frequencies a little bit lower, a little bit less boomy and tubby than the standard clip, and keeping the high frequency snap and crack that's being added more similar to the original kick. So basically, it's a subtle difference, but you can really hear it if you, if you have these two and play with them yourself on good speakers outside of YouTube. <laughs> in your own controlled environment on lots of different sounds, but I'll just tell you from my experience, Saturate sounds always the closest to the original sound in overall timbre, regardless of how hard or soft I'm setting it. And that's what I love about Saturate. So thank you very much for staying with me to this point. Uh, it was a long one. It's probably my longest one yet. But there's a lot to show and understand about clippers, and I hope you found this useful, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.